Hundreds of thousands of researchers around the world are working to improve life and address imminent threats to humanity. Often their research ends up in the scientific valley of death in the form of publications and patents that never see the light of day. That is about to change. Welcome to the Lab to Startup podcast, hosted by Naresh Sankara, founder and executive director of the Berkeley Postdoc Entrepreneurship Program at the University of California, Berkeley. This show has two main goals. Share the stories of those who have successfully founded startups based on their own research and highlight resources needed to help those aspiring to launch startups in the deep tech space. Whether it's electric cars, vaccines, addressing climate change concerns, or possibly establishing life on other planets, Naresh and his esteemed guests want to help scientists, engineers, faculty, and researchers bring their innovations to market. Learn more and subscribe today at labtostartup.com. And now, here's Naresh. I have three guests on my show today from MedTech Innovator. Paul Grant is the founder and CEO of the program. Eilat Marom is the program director for Biotools Innovator, which focuses specifically on Biotools. And Jim West, the associate director for Biotools Innovator, who was previously the co-founder and CEO of Clara Biotech, which was founded in 2018 and acquired in 2023 by Innova Prep. Jim was the first founder to go through the Biotools program, and we felt it'll be a great addition to hear from him as well. According to Silicon Valley Insights, MedTech Innovator is the largest accelerator of medical technologies in the world. In its 11th year of operation, it has over 600 startups in the portfolio and received 281 FDA approvals and also over $7 billion in follow-on funding. In this episode of Lab to Startup, we first discuss some of the challenges that affect MedTech and Biotool technology startups, and then go into ways that MedTech Innovator is helping founders, especially around lessons learned and how the program has evolved into one of the best accelerators in the space. Biotools is a space that is very dear to me because my last startup was in the space. And I understand some of the issues that affect founders firsthand. And I believe this conversation will help founders in MedTech and Biotool space. Paul, Eilat, and Jim, I've been looking forward to talking to you guys for a while now, and timing never worked out well earlier, and I'm glad we are able to connect today. Thank you, Naresh, for having us here, the MedTech Innovator and Biotools Innovator team. Thank you, Naresh. Yeah, we're very happy to be here. Paul, you have a super interesting background. You transitioned from being a venture capitalist to founding MedTech Innovator. I believe a good place to start this conversation would be to talk about the story behind founding MedTech Innovator. What got you interested in this space? Sure. Yeah. Hi, everyone out there who's listening. Great to be here. I had a really interesting journey to getting here at MedTech Innovator. I started off as an entrepreneur, probably like many of the people who are listening today. I started eight different companies in the tech, MedTech, and biopharma space. So I have a very keen perception of what it's like to be out there trying to solve a huge problem and being out talking to investors constantly, begging for money and being in that side of things. And the challenges of being in a, not only a startup, but a startup in the med tech and biopharma space over the years, it's very different than the regular tech world where you can just have an idea to start some new photo sharing app or these days AI and everybody throws money at you. But on the med tech side, when we're out there trying to save lives and make everybody healthy for some reason, People don't throw money at you in the same way. It's a lot more work. And part of that's because things are regulated and there's a lot of aspects to it. But ultimately, I understand that journey. So I had the founder background and one of my investors in my last company said, hey, we have some companies that we've been incubating and you have time because we are in the process of screening for leads for a particular drug that we were developing. And while we were doing that, they said, hey, could you jump in and help us with some of these other companies that we're incubating, which I did. And then after about four months of that, they said, you know, why don't you just join our firm? We think you'd be a good venture capital investor. And as a startup, you always want to understand that other side. You always want to go, what are those investors doing? How does that work? So I thought like, hey, I'd be a VC for a while, maybe a year, maybe two years. And then I'd go back and find some great company and jump out to go run that company. So I eagerly said yes to do that. And I joined this fund, the company's called Research Corporation Technologies or RCT Ventures. And 
as I said, I thought it would be a short stint of a couple of years, but it turned out to be 12 years. And I learned that amongst other things, it's really nice to have the money instead of always being on the other side trying to <laughs> find money. But I learned a ton about how the industry works. And I happened to be there during the time of that last financial crisis when the real estate market led to that big crash. And it totally upended the scene for investing. And a lot of the venture funds that were around back in the 2010 timeframe disappeared. The ones that were really sophisticated and knew a lot about the med tech space just went out of business or decided to do something else because it was really hard for them to raise capital. And what was replaced were all these really interesting angel investors and seed organizations, a lot of them economic development focused, who had great well-meaning intentions and would fund these companies, but didn't know very much about bringing products to the market. And so as a result, as one of the few venture investors that were still out there, I would start to see these companies who had real issues. And those issues were not the product they were developing or the clinical problem they were trying to solve. They were all these other things. And they were usually the result of bad advice that the local vendor who really didn't know what they were doing had given them some bad advice or the investors had given them some bad advice and said, hey, why don't you just go fast and break things like all these mm -hmm. other tech companies do. But you can't really do that in the medical space. So MedTech Innovator was a program I initially started with the idea of helping to provide some guidance and mentorship to the companies that I would encounter that I would say, wow. If we could have met that company a year ago, I could have fixed that problem. And with this program, the intent was to do that. So that was the origin of what became MedTech Innovator Today was a program initially with competitions and then eventually with a full accelerator that would provide mentorship and guidance to these startups so that they would hopefully not make mistakes that would end their company. Because as I said, there's too many other things that go into being a successful startup that deal with the regulatory risk or the clinical risk. But there's other executional things are things that can be solved and can be prevented. And so that was the origin of MedTech Innovator. We started it within the venture fund. And within a very short period of time, we had Johnson & Johnson and some other entities coming on board who said, hey, we like what you're doing and we want to help support this. And we realized after a couple of years that for us to grow the program, it really made sense to spin it out. So we spun it out as a separate entity, as a nonprofit. And I went along with the nonprofit to run it. So we spun it out in 2016 after starting it in 2013. And MedTech Innovator rapidly grew to what we are today, which is the largest accelerator for healthcare on the planet. That is a fascinating story. I'm happy to see a founder becoming an investor especially in this space, as uh, someone like you really understands the challenges of building a medtech startup. Paul, you mentioned something about how tech is not a problem, but there are all these other problems which founders and startups fail because of. Can you say more about what these problems are? I think a really easy one that is something that most people overlook is just telling your value proposition succinctly is something that a lot of startups struggle with. And in fact, all of them struggle with in various ways. I have yet to meet somebody where they give the pitch and I go, perfect pitch, no changes. There's no cases where that's happened. Everybody has something where you go, God, I just don't understand that particular aspect of your story or why are you doing this or explain your business model. You left out the business model or I don't understand your strategy for how you're going to generate evidence or get to reimbursement or whatever it might be. People struggle just telling the story. So the first thing is just being really good at articulating the value proposition that you offer. Most people say something like, well, we're going to be better. We're going to be faster. We're going to be cheaper. And that doesn't tell you anything. Those are just words. We need specifics. So one thing that we do at MedTech Innovator and BioTools Innovator is spend a lot of time helping people on telling their story, both in a verbal format when they're making pitches in front of investors or in an audience, which is very different. And people confuse that too. They use the same deck that they would show to an investor with all the detailed small fonts and graphs and, and all this stuff. And then they put it up in front of a huge audience and people sit there and they try to read all the stuff on the slide. And they're not listening to the presenter because they're trying to read and they're changing slides and people just, they get lost and all that. So just helping people tell their story is the first thing. And where we've been perfecting that over the last 11 years 
and how to do that. And I think we're pretty good at that. That's one thing. Another thing is just this market has evolved. And let's say on the med tech side, not the biotool side, but on the med tech side, the market has evolved from regulatory risk and being worried about getting approved by the FDA to how are you going to get paid? And I said it's evolved because the FDA has really become much more of a partner to companies in helping to bring these products to market than a hurdle is the way that it used to be. It used to be a barrier. We'd say, oh, how are you going to get past the FDA? And that was obviously not the right way to be doing things. And the agency's really changed. Now it's reimbursement. You can get approved by the FDA, but is anyone going to pay for this? And so it's the payers and whether they're private or public or other customers, what is your strategy to getting payment? That is probably one of the biggest things and being able to really understand that from the beginning. And we find that most of our companies really haven't thought that through when they get to us. And that's something, again, that it just takes research and it takes a strategy and it takes talking to a lot of customers, not just the people who are around you in your hospital or wherever you happen to be, but all these other people who are going to be customers and really thinking through that strategy, literally at the whiteboard stage, at the very beginning, when you're developing your product, you need to understand the reimbursement strategy. And that's very different than the way it used to be. Those are some things I'll give you a couple more really quick. The wrong CEO will kill a company every single time. We see that constantly. So you see this great technology, huge unmet need, the person sitting there and they're pitching you. And then they have next to them, maybe it's the scientific founder. And then they have the person who's the CEO. And the CEO might be a clinician or it might be somebody who understands the market, but they're full-time as a clinician. Like they have a practice where they're a busy surgeon and they're the CEO one day a week or something or an hour or two a day. And that's not going to be sustainable. You have to have a CEO who can live, eat, and breathe this company 24-7. And if the current CEO says, oh, I'm going to make it work, don't worry, you can trust me, then you know that that's not going to work out. Or they've chosen the wrong person. Like literally, I've had companies that we know well who will be sitting there and the CEO is someone who made a lot of money in real estate and now wants to kind of give back. And so they're going to be the CEO of this very, very detailed, intricate medical device that is very complex, but because they know business, they're going to be the CEO. And you start asking them questions, they don't understand anything. And you go like, I don't understand how you're going to bring this product to the market. And they're like, oh, well, I'm going to surround myself with smart people. And that never works. Like you never find that real estate person who's, so it's just having the wrong CEO. And then you talk to the scientific founder and they go, well, I already gave them half the company and I don't know what I'm going to do. Maybe we can So having the wrong CEO, investors, everybody else is going to run away. Maybe I'll give you one or two other little quick examples. One is something that we saw for in a huge way at MedTech Innovator is staying in the stealth mode for way too long. So you'll talk to companies and they'll go, well, I have this thing we're working on, but we don't want to tell anybody about it because we're worried that someone's going to steal our idea. And so they don't talk to people and they don't seek advice or they don't check to make sure that people really want the product that they're developing or that somebody will pay for it because they want to stay in stealth mode. That never works in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So that's a terrible idea to be in stealth mode. And the other thing is choosing the wrong indication. We have companies all the time that will come in and go, well, first we're going to develop it, let's say in some obscure oncology area for some particular cancer that they say, well, my lab is well-funded for that. So we're going to get, we're first going to get approved for that. And then we're going to go up to the real market, which is prostate cancer. And the problem is the investors aren't going to support them in the tiny market that people aren't really interested in, regardless of how well-funded their lab is. So they're going to spend all this time and effort and money trying to get something approved that no one's going to fund them to continue to develop. So those are some tiny examples, but these are things that, you know, you can make that change. You could find the right CEO. You could make the right decision about the right indication from the beginning and You could get out of your little closed market where you're just talking to yourself and your small little echo chamber and go talk to people. These are easily correctable things or make your pitch right. Yeah. So I could go on and on forever, Naresh. (laughs) All big problems. I've seen them firsthand. I experienced that. I did some of the mistakes. I just want to touch on one problem that you mentioned about getting paid. I think most people developing this medtech technologies are scientists or engineers who are good at the technology, but never thought about who's going to pay for that. Maybe you have a story or two about how you help them think about it, like at the drawing board stage. I think that's a great approach because if there's nobody going to pay for that, they should not do that because uh, it could save lives. But if it's not paying money, you can't save the company. 
That's right. And there's literally in hundreds of companies that have FDA approval that do not have payment and are struggling right now because they don't have customers who can pay. And again, when I say customers who can pay, the customers have the money, but if there's not reimbursement, then they're not able to get paid back. So if it's a hospital and they buy this medical device and they put it into the patient, if they're not going to be reimbursed by Medicare or with the private payers, then they're not going to buy it unless it's like an academic center and they're trying to do some publishable research or they have some reasons why they could do that. Or sometimes the IDNs can do it, the integrated networks where they're able to provide care to their membership, like a Kaiser. Sometimes they can purchase these things without reimbursement. There's those kinds of entities, but most of the system relies on reimbursement. And so I'll tell you a little bit about our overall program. The MedTech Innovator is an accelerator, and we have a number of components that companies go through as part of the accelerator. And one of them is called our value program. And the value program draws its name from value-based care. So the idea is that the world is shifting from fee-based care to value-based care. And instead of saying, hey, we're going to just pay you a fixed amount of money for that device, people are shifting to a world in which you can get paid based on the value deliver. So for example, if today the issue, let's say for a particular disease might be an infection, let's say like somebody gets a catheter and that catheter is placed in the body and there can be infection because of that and the patients get readmitted to the hospital. That might cost $75,000 every time there's a readmission that the hospital has to pay. So if you can save them money, if you can say, well, we can prevent that readmission because we have a monitoring technology with a company called Hive, for example, in our portfolio that has a technology that can help monitor so that you look for those infections. And in that case, instead of saying, well, just pay us a fixed amount for this catheter, hopefully it'll do something. They can say, look, we're gonna wait. We're gonna patiently wait and see if we get past that normal window of time, which might be two weeks or three weeks when there's typically an infection and the patient gets readmitted, they get past that window. We know we're in the clear and you can pay us a portion of what you would have had to pay if there was a readmission. And that's value-based pricing. So we have companies then that enter MedTech Innovator. I mentioned that company Hive a minute ago, and they're able to analyze the market, analyze the reimbursement landscape, understand what percentage of the time people will develop an infection. And if they can save money, they can actually develop their business model around that. And they can test that. They can talk to hospital systems in advance. They can run pilots together and they can prove that they're able to lower readmission rates and get paid on a value-based model. So that's one example, which is very different than just entering the market the way companies typically do and start to try to charge for something. And People either pay for it or they don't. And unfortunately, most of the time they don't pay because they say we got to wait for there to be in reimbursement. And so if you can go to the payers early on and say, hey, here's our value proposition. We've really analyzed this. We understand the economics. Will you pay at that rate? And again, they know their data. The payers have very, very good data on what the model looks like for these cases. And they can say, yeah, we'll pay you. If you can reduce the rate by this amount, we'll pay you this amount. So that's one example, but we do that with every single one of our companies. That is phenomenal help. I know a lot of founders who struggle with that. I want to connect back to that reimbursement. Like, do you have partners who are actually talking to the payers? Because it's like a black box between the founder and the payers. Shed some light into that black box. And if somebody is trying to navigate, it's just as a pointer. So how would they do that? So again, at MedTech Innovator, so I can, I'm just speaking specifically about us and our program and how we function, we have value coaches. And those value coaches, we had, I think, 45 of them last year. Again, this is just a small part of what we do, but a key part. So we had 45 value coaches. Each of them is paired with multiple companies and each company gets multiple value coaches. So they'll have like two value coaches in most cases, and they will work with those value coaches over the course of several months to refine their value proposition. And those people that I'm talking about as value coaches, some cases are at some of the large strategics. So they might be at a J and J or Gore or some of our other partners. And that's their job is to do this for their company. And so they're helping our companies as part of the mentorship that we do in our program. 
So they'll be coaches. And so they're already interacting with the payers and they do this as professionally. Then we also have people who do that as a contractor. So you hire these firms and their job again is to work with multiple small and large companies. We have a company called Evidence Mattered, a woman named Leslie Weiss, for example. That's her job. She just deals with reimbursement all day, 24 seven. Well, maybe she sleeps a little bit. I don't know when, but she does. And she works with all these companies. And so during MedTech Innovator, she'll do the same thing. She'll work with several of our companies and she'll will help them with that process. And so what we're not doing is saying, well, you're, we don't bring in Anthem and say Anthem is going to make this evaluation. We bring in the people who work with Anthem all the time mm-hmm. or who work with Medicare or with some of the other agencies. Specifically, that's all they do. That's their expertise. And we have, as I said, 45 of them that we can allocate across the startups in each year's program. That is a great value add for founders looking to get into this program. Like maybe you can talk about how would one get into the program itself? What are you looking for in startups? What are the good things and the bad things? How can one get into the program? We have a very, I would say, simple formula, but it takes some time, obviously, to fill in the application. It takes usually a couple hours. You have to apply. That's number one. We don't just pick companies. So they filled an application. It might take them an hour or two to fill in the application. It could take longer depending on how much of the information they already have at their fingertips. We ask the typical questions that investors would ask you. So there's not a lot of surprises, but depending on company's stage of maturity, some people have more of the answers already at their fingertips. So the first thing is you have to apply and you can apply on our website, which is just medtechinnovator.org or biotoolsinnovator.org for biotools. And what we're looking for is criteria on the med tech side are companies that are up and running, that have a team that have at least a prototype of some kind. A lot of them have something a lot more mature, but that have at least a prototype and some evidence that this is going to work. So we're not looking for people who have an idea, who walk in and say, hey, I want to cure cancer. That's not what we're looking for. They have other avenues. There's lots of other accelerators that are there to help people who have an idea and say, okay, here's how you incorporate and here's how you do all these things. We're not going to teach you that. We're more like the graduate schools, I said. So we're looking for people who are up and running, have those prototypes, have some early evidence, which can be bench data. It could be literature-based data. It could be hopefully clinical data in many cases to show that it looks like this is going to work. We still have a lot of challenges ahead of us, but it looks like this device is going to work. And they have to have a team, as I mentioned before, who can actually execute. It's okay to have that clinical founder who's a physician and who's still a surgeon. That's okay as long as they have other people too. It's very hard to have the one man or one woman show. We have had them go through MedTech Innovator, but they're not as successful. They struggle a little more because they just don't have the time to dedicate, not just to MTI, but just to their company. So we want to have somebody who's full-time is really one of the criteria we look for. And again, we have accepted people who didn't have that, but it doesn't go as well. So we like to see there's a team that is at least somebody who's full-time. Occasionally, we have somebody who spins out of a university and they're able to commit to full-time afterwards during the period of our accelerator. But again, we like to have people who have teams and we'd like to have people who have the ability to execute. So what we don't want is someone who shows up and goes, look, we have a team and we have a device and a little bit of evidence, but we're totally out of money and we're just going to have to spend full-time fundraising. And maybe if things go well, we'll be able to execute like in six months from now or a year from now if we raise money. That's not good for us. We want people who we're going to give the advice to, give the mentorship to, and they are going to be able to execute on that advice. And if they need to go raise more capital before they can do anything, they're like, look, we're literally out of money and we can't do anything then we'll just say reapply next year. And maybe you'll meet some investors during the process of applying, which we can talk about in a minute. But the point is, we want people who are able to execute on the advice we give them. So they don't have to have a ton of money. They just have to have enough to execute during our program. The program itself is four months. So as long as they have the ability to execute during those four months, that's going to be some of the key criteria. Great. I remember you mentioning this is a nonprofit establishment. Maybe shed some light on like you are a venture capitalist to begin with and why this nonprofit structure and where does the organization take any equity in this program? Talk about what happens if they get into the program. So we started this as a nonprofit with intent for doing that. So the intent was we wanted to have this be a no strings attached model, which basically, you know, you have 
as I said, Jane J and Beck and Dickinson and all these partners, we have 20 something strategics who are involved. We wanted to make sure that they could participate in the program without feeling competitive with each other and without the startup saying, wait, but I have to give up something to be part of this. I'm giving up my IP or I'm giving up equity. We wanted to take all that off the table. We just wanted to say, as our goal at MedTech Innovator was to find the world's best startups and bring them to the world's best ecosystem of support. And that's what I believe we've done and we continue to do. And we didn't want to have a bar. We didn't want someone to say, well, I'd participate, but you want 5% of the equity, so we're not going to do it. We didn't want that. So we said, look, we're not going to take any equity for participation. We're not going to charge you fees for participation. And no one is going to get any rights to your technology for participating. There's no strings attached. We do give people the opportunity to have an investment from a fund that is being created that's called the MedTech Advantage Fund that is designed to invest in graduates. But that is a completely separate entity, and there's no discounts. There's no terms that would make somebody say, oh, well, I'm giving a special price or something to that fund. That's just a fund that is designed to help catalyze investments. So there's no, for participation in MedTech Innovator, we don't charge you any fees or equity for doing that. And the nonprofit allows all of our partners to participate in a non-competitive way. They're there to support the ecosystem. So they're supporting it as donors, as sponsors, if you will. And that is a really nice model because everybody understands that that is the structure. No one comes in and says, well, that's my company and you can't see it or you don't get access to it. Like everybody understands that they're there to help. And we have over 500 people who are, if you will, volunteering with MedTech Innovator every year at all these different companies, whether they be large companies like J&J or whether they're some small single person service providers who are providing some of that value coaching and everything in between, or payers and other organizations, there are people who are helping to mentor and work with these startups. And they're doing that without any compensation. We're not paying them to do this. So again, having this nonprofit structure with a mission to improve human health is what allows us to do this in a way that is, as I said, it prohibits anybody from saying, I don't want to be part of that. It's the opposite. Everybody says, how can I be part of this? The investors come to us and say, how do I get my startups into MedTech Innovator? You would typically think an investor would say, oh, I don't want my companies going through an accelerator. They're way past that if I'm investing. But it's the opposite. At MedTech Innovator, the investors come to us and say, "Like, here's the three startups that we funded last year. I'd like them in MedTech Innovator. And they still have to go through the same process, but they have a motivation. They understand that going through MTI gives these companies not only a cachet, that they can say they're a MedTech Innovator company, which is important, but also it gives them huge visibility at the big conferences throughout our industry. That's where all of our companies get showcased. Like we don't have some small demo day in some obscure location that people come to to meet our companies. Our companies are showcased at the largest conferences in the entire industry, the AvMed annual meeting, the Device Talks conference in Boston, the MedTech Strategist conference which is in Dublin and San Francisco or other places in California, the Wilson Sonsini annual conference that happens every year in San Francisco. That's where our companies are showcased. So the industry gets to meet them and investors get to see them. There's huge benefits for being an MTI. But the point is that these companies really want to be an MTI and the nonprofit structure facilitates that. This is phenomenal. I think you are one of the first accelerators actually I've come across with this model. I really like this because one of the problems I hear from founders is like they go from one incubator to the other incubator, one accelerator to the other accelerator, giving up equity at each of the stages, knowing that it's going to take a long time to get to the market. I'm glad you're doing this. I know we have two other guests uh, eagerly waiting. I want to hear from them as well. I think I wanted to hear about how the space is evolving, how the investors are evolving, because relative to the tech market, these are not billion dollar markets or $10 billion markets. Has the space evolved? How are you preparing the founders to meet the investor requirements? And what kind of investors are putting money into the space? So the space absolutely has evolved. It's continuing to evolve. And not only the pandemic, but then some of the financial crises or other things that are happening out in the world, some of the macroeconomics are driving a lot of activity in the space. So investors and also the stock market and the lack of IPOs has driven a lot of behavior in the last several years. I always tell the companies in MedTech Innovator, 
that you are the anomalies. Like, don't worry about what everyone else is doing. Don't worry about what you read and you're panicking about because our companies all raise money and all is obviously an extreme. Let's say 90 plus percent of our companies raise the money they're hoping to raise in the time frame they're hoping to raise it. Over the course of 11 years, we've had less than 5% of our companies go out of business over 11 years, which is crazy because typically you hear things like there was some article someone sent me the other day on LinkedIn where it was like 75% of medtech startups fail. Uh, in our case, it's, as I said, under 5%. And there's a reason for that. It's because we're incredibly choosy and we're also very good at helping these companies and making sure they're meeting investors and the right kinds of investors. So you asked before about the types. So in the investors who often support companies at the very early stages, the seed, the series A, even the series B in some cases, still are angel investors. They're in some cases, family offices. They're seed organizations that might be economic development organizations, like an organization, let's say in Kansas or in Utah or wherever that's designed to support local companies. They'll provide the seed funding in many cases, but then they don't have the pockets to keep going. And that's where you have to go to institutional investors. And there are plenty of them investing. So we have a database at MedTech Innovator of every single investor who's invested in every one of our companies. There's over 3,600 unique entities that have invested in MedTech Innovator's portfolio. A lot of them are angels. Like I was just looking at the data this morning to see of the angels who invested in our portfolio in 2023, there were 79 that we know of, 79 angels. I know there's a lot more, but these are the ones that we have available either from PitchBook or from our companies directly reporting to us. But there were 79 angels that I can see that invested in our portfolio this year, but there were 600 entities in total that invested in our portfolio this year. And so they're varying organizations. Some of them are corporate venture capital, not typical 10-year venture funds that are supported by limited partners, but they're corporate venture capital. Like for example, Olympus, one of our partners has a corporate venture capital group and they invest directly in startups and have invested in our startups in some cases. So they're doing a lot of the investing. And then occasionally you'll have other entities that are investing that are either affiliated with a government of some kind, you know, like Ireland, for example, has Enterprise Ireland, who is incredibly active in supporting their startups. Or in Singapore, there's Enterprise Singapore, and there's lots of organizations like this. These are organizations that are very good at understanding how to get these companies initially off the ground and help them in the early stages, but then they rely on all those institutional investors who are more professional at the later stages of supporting companies. One of the places that we can shine is that we have this incredible access to investors and we show our companies and we show investors which of our companies are raising capital. And that's probably one of the biggest challenges is that investors, they may have the money, they just don't know who's out there trying to raise capital. Unless they bump into them at a conference, unless they see them on an airplane, and they literally do. Like somebody be like, yeah, I met that investor on the plane. They were sitting next to me or I met him in the airport lounge right before the flight. And that's how, you know, when we say, how did you meet that investor? We ask them all the time, like, oh, our kids are playing soccer together. It's a very inefficient market is the point. And so we do things within our portfolio to really help them make sure that they can raise capital, not only from investors, but from the right investors. As I mentioned earlier in the beginning, my origin story, we want people are going to give these companies good advice. So we lean hard on either the very sophisticated angels who understand the space, not just the well-meaning person who wants to write a check, but could really be a problem later. We want the people who understand how to bring products to market. And a lot of ex-CEOs or current CEOs even at some of these large companies will personally invest in startups. A lot of our startups invest in each other, even if it's small amounts, but they can really help each other. So those are the types of people who are supporting these organizations. Some can write really big checks. Some can only write $25,000 checks, but you'd be surprised how much even a small investor with the right network and the right experience can really make a difference for these companies. And so we spend a lot of time on that. And the last thing I'll mention is that if you look at the entire market, so HSBC just put out a report yesterday with the latest funding data for 2023. So it looked at the entire healthcare sector for all of 2023, and they look at the different spaces. They look at biotech and pharma. They look at diagnostics and tools. They look at medical devices. They look at digital health. And within those sectors, they tell you how much money each section raised. 
So last year, 2023, there was seven billion dollars of funding raised by the med tech sector, by the medical device sector. And of that seven billion dollars, roughly two billion it was actually just under two billion was a graduate of med tech innovator. So about 28% of the entire capital raise last year went to graduates of MedTech Innovator. So looking at our data, we can tell you quite a bit about the behavior of investors, who is investing, what they're investing in, why they're investing in what they're doing. Hopefully we can draw some insights from our data. So I can tell you that people are investing. Our companies raised a lot of capital last year, but as I said, they are the anomalies in terms of the overall sector. I think a lot of companies out there are certainly struggling and last year was hard. I think the investors I talked to and There'll be a lot of them in San Francisco next week at the JP Morgan Healthcare Conference. A lot of those investors were just looking for 2023 to be in their rearview mirror. They have capital to deploy and they will be writing checks. So the doors are going to open for a lot of these funds in 2024. And I'm hoping the IPO window is opening up as well. Excellent. Yeah, and those are some phenomenal numbers. Very impressive. I think we can go on for a few hours. I have to bring you back for a long form conversation. As you can tell, I'm deeply interested in the space, being in that space myself. But I also want to touch upon something under your umbrella called the BioTools Islet. I'm glad to have you here. Maybe you could start out by differentiating what Metech is and what BioTools are so that it gives clarity to the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Naresh. So Biotools Innovators, you've heard from Paul a lot about MedTech Innovator, how we really focus there with the MedTech Innovator US and Asia Pacific programs on innovators that are developing technologies that are either medical devices, diagnostics, or digital health. While I can tell you that what I've heard from Paul and the leadership team, and when I was brought on board to help grow the Biotools program and to help launch that program, is that there were really a lot of technologies that didn't quite fit that bill, right? So a lot of innovators were looking for support, but were developing technologies that were a little different. And that really showed the need for developing a specific program, a very unique program that really focused on those innovators that are developing what other people call tech bio or bio tools. They're synonymous, basically. And they are really the enabling technologies or the platform technologies that are really at the core and enabling drug discovery, drug development, and everything in the way, right? So cell manufacturing, all of these technologies are enabling that. And so without those technologies, it would be very difficult to continue running that industry. And this is why Biotools Innovator was formed to really create a space for those innovators, those developing technologies to find the very unique and specific needs that these specific founders have in that ecosystem. And so Part of our mission and our goal, and I think that's what we are doing now, is really growing that unique ecosystem. It's a pretty close-knit one, and we are proud to say that we have a lot of the industry executives, a lot of the corporates, a lot of the strategics, a lot of the people involved in innovation in this landscape as part of our ecosystem supporting the companies that are coming to Biotools Innovator as we grow and as they continue to get to know us. Jim is one great example, and then we'll hand it over to Jim in a little bit to tell us how he found Biotools Innovator as a founder initially in 2021 in the inaugural cohort of the program. But really, the idea was to create a unique ecosystem, a unique place for innovators that are developing these kind of technologies. And let me give you some examples to what does that look like. So what is a biotools technology? So under the umbrella of this program, you could find things like think genomics, proteomics, transfection technologies. Think about cell analysis technologies, cell culturing technologies. You can even look at lab operation and AI-aided drug discovery. These are things we see a lot in this program. Cell manufacturing technologies. These are the kind of things that we see under the umbrella of this program. 
And on the other side of it, we also see a diagnostics platform. So part of what we're looking at and part of that tools market are the diagnostic platforms and the diagnostic technologies that could serve as platform technologies to several types of diagnostics and several indications. So that's more or less what we see under mm -hmm. that umbrella of biotools, and that is the need that we saw before that was answered actually by founding Biotools Innovator. Excellent. Thank you for elaborating on what Biotools is. Maybe you can talk about some of the unique challenges as Paul was talking about some of the issues that Medtech goes through. Are they any different in this space? Well, a lot of the challenges the founders experience are similar to what you'd find in healthcare in general, right? Because of the difficult nature of bringing an innovation to market in the healthcare market, as Paul mentioned earlier, a lot of the challenges are similar, but there are definitely things that we see now after three years of having Biotools Innovator as one of our programs, there are definitely unique challenges that we see. The first thing I want to say, and that is my biggest observation from these three years, Paul talked about how companies are focused on a narrow application that may not be the right application. With the biotools, what we're actually seeing is a little bit of the flip side of this, mm -hmm. and is the fact that because platform technologies can really be used for multiple applications, so almost unending opportunities, right? And so if you look at something like PCR, right now, post-pandemic, everybody knows on the street, everybody you stop on the street, you know what PCR is. PCR is a classic biotools technology, right? If we were 30, 40 years back now and PCR would be a great innovation to bring to the biotools program. And if you look at PCR, there are so many applications that can be the application used for this technology. And so what we are seeing as a challenge is the difficulty in finding that application, what we call the problem looking for a solution, looking for a problem, right? So that inability to focus on the application that is your killer app, that is the biggest challenge that we see in this specific market. So that would be my biggest observation specifically to that market. The other one, and this is something I'd love GM to expand on here, is the unique type of investors that you need in order to fund your innovation in this space. So a lot of the founders have been telling us, and this is something we hear day in, day out from life science tools innovators is that the traditional investors in these technologies were biotech investors. These investors mostly invest in clinical assets, in therapeutics, where it's a very different investment model, very different ROI, very different timelines, very different resources needed. However, when you're developing a tool, not all biotech investors really understand the different nature of what does that mean to fund such a technology. It is not necessarily going to give you the same return or the same model that these investors are used to fund. And so when you're looking for investors in that space, a lot of the founders tell us, how difficult it is to convey what they're doing differently and why they need different support from their investors, from their board, or from people in the ecosystem. And I said I wanted to hand it over to Jim because I think Jim has a really great story as a founder himself of a life science tool technology that I think we should all hear. Before I jump into Jim, I just want to elaborate on this problem of a solution trying to find a problem. And that also, I want to probably have Paul chime into this market aspect of it, especially in the buy tool space, we might find one or two users, but then it's not scalable. I just came out of one biotools company. I was a part of the founding team and then we could not, you know, we talked to AstraZeneca, they wanted to use it, but then nobody wants to pay for the trials. I think this is a problem plaguing both the medtech and biotools space where people want to try, but nobody's willing to pay for this. Any advice for that or how are you dealing with that issue at Medtech Innovator? So starting with medtech, on the medtech side, what we encourage people to do is to find not only 
that kind of early adopter market, which certainly you can find. So people can do the research and they can say, okay, who's going to be the ones that really want this product? Let me price it. Let me focus on them. Let me go to them because that's the typical kind of crossing the chasm, find your early adopters. But then it's getting the majority and not just those early adopters that really become, you know, getting to the mainstream is the key. So we encourage people to be talking to those mainstream adopters from the beginning and making sure that what you're building is going to be attractive to them too. And then to have some evidence that people who are going to be your majority customers really do want to buy. And because if you do just that little early, hey, of course, those people are going to buy it kind of people, it's not going to convince the investors and the other people later that the other people will want to pay for it. So there's always a little bit of a chicken in the egg, but you want to have some evidence that customers who are going to represent those more mainstream adopters are also going to be interested. So we try to find representation of those as well for the early markets. Don't just focus on one site or one market, have multiple markets have multiple sites that you're targeting for your early customers. Those are some of the things that we encourage our startups to do. And to make sure that, again, you're not just selling to your institution. A lot of people have emerged from a particular ecosystem or institution. Don't just focus there because those people might be just doing something because you're you and you have some reputation or you have something and they want to support you. So we really encourage people to get out of their local ecosystem, go to the high volume centers, find those places where people are really going to make a big difference. You mentioned before, sometimes these aren't billion dollar markets and they're not. Sometimes they're multi hundred million dollar markets, but if you can capture a large part of it, that's a real business. And we want to make sure that people can. So that's a key part of this is getting out of your local ecosystem and finding customers, potential customers or people who would buy early on and not just getting a letter of support, but really getting them to buy in and participate in some way. So we do that on the med tech side And we make sure, as I said, that they're going to have the evidence that's required to then convince people later on in terms of reimbursement. So that requires not just the data for regulatory approval that the FDA might require, but it's the early adoption market data that will convince somebody that with the right sales force, because they know you as a startup will not have a huge sales force, but with a larger sales force, we'll be able to really penetrate a market. And so you're trying to demonstrate if you're trying to, whether it's for investors or even potentially for an acquisition, you're trying to show that the market is interested in what you have to sell and that in the hands of a way more competent and way more experienced sales force, that you'll be able to really make a dent, a big dent in this market. So that's some of what we do on the med tech side. And maybe Jim or Ilet wants to talk about the biotool side. Yeah. I'm happy to jump in here to say that a really big phenomena that we see in the life science tools portion of our accelerator is that a lot of these companies, because of the challenge you're talking about, these are not necessarily big markets that they're focused on, at least for their initial applications. Some of the creative ways around it, it's really common to see companies that have a service model ahead of having their product ready for a specific market so or for a specific application. It takes a while to develop, as we know, both a medical device and a life science tool for a specific applications, right? To have features that will address the challenges of that specific application. If you're developing something for cell and gene therapy, that might be different than traditional antibody therapeutics, right? And so While that is happening, and because of these challenges, I think that it's very common to see companies using the service model two ways, right? It's kind of twofold. One is to generate revenue and support the company throughout this journey of product development. And the other is to get feedback and better understanding of the needs of the customers that would be their next application. And this is something we really try to drive with our companies in the biotools program. And when I say we try to drive that, the way we do that is really through working with our mentors and our corporate partners. And if you work with mentors from companies like Thermo Fisher and Eppendorf and Agilent and Danaher, these are companies that have 
a lot of these technologies under their own umbrella and have been through those journeys, understanding clients from the perspective of a large corporation, but still looking at the same basic issues. And so working with these mentors really helps direct the companies to how they can approach multiple applications, multiple customer types as they are still developing their product. Yeah, I agree. Because some of my previous guests who are by tools founders alluded to the same story. Some had to go the service route and then sometimes having the right person at the right partnership at the company is super important. I think that's where groups like yourself come into play where you can help sort through the noise and get to the right people fast. I'm, I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. And Jim, sorry for keeping you waiting. I'm so glad you're joining. I think this is the first time we have this model, thanks to Islet again, for recommending that we have somebody like Jim who has gone through the program, the first cohort I hear. Talk about your experience. Like when you entered MedTech Innovator, what were you looking for? And then once you graduated and once you're building the company, maybe you can shed some light on how you benefited. So I actually came across MedTech Innovator back in 2019. At that stage, my company was a little over a year old. We had licensed some technology from a university and had gotten a SBIR phase one from the National Cancer Institute, along with an additional grant called iCorps at NIH to do customer discovery and market research, which I know we were talking about earlier. And as an entrepreneur, I feel like the market research phase is one of the most important critical aspects of starting your company. Because what you learn during that process will affect all aspects of your business and the decisions you make around your model. So I do believe very strongly in that aspect. I actually came across MedTech because we were emailed by the NIH and they're like, hey, there's this MedTech innovator program and anybody who's got a phase one SBIR through the National Cancer Institute is welcome to apply. So I ended up applying, made it through the pitch event selection. I'm not sure how, (laughs) but I showed up, I think it was in Minnesota. And we were another like 50, 60 companies there. And we got to take turns meeting with investors and strategics around the room. And it was a really great experience. But what I kind of came back with was we're a med tech accelerator and you're a bio tool company. And we don't really know what to do with you. Even though we love what you're doing, it's important, but you're just not a fit for us. Jim, maybe you can plug in what you were doing. I think that'll be helpful. Sure. We actually had a solution for next generation liquid biopsy diagnostics and targeted drug delivery therapeutics, leveraging exosomes, which are like the FedEx delivery system of your cells. Pretty new stuff, very cutting edge. But essentially, we were developing the platform to enable this technology for everybody. And so a few years later, I think they reached out to me and said, hey, we started a biotools innovator accelerator, and we think it'd be great. Would you apply? So I went back and we made it in through the pitch event and through everything else. And it was a fantastic program. And for me, it was kind of funny because at the event in the program, it's the ecosystem for biotools companies. And prior to that, I'd been spending years trying to figure out how to fundraise and build that network and get those connections And it was hundreds of meetings. You have meetings with investors, with angels and everybody else. And they give you an intro, you meet somebody else. And over and over, I heard from biotech investors that we don't really like your company. (laughs) It's not investable in our thesis. You're not treating a disease. You're not curing a condition. You're not going to the FDA. You're going to market really soon, not in five to 10 years. And as odd as it sounds, I was told multiple times, you've got multiple shots at plate and I want one. I want a thousand extra turn or nothing. And you've got way too many ways to win, (laughs) which is bizarre feedback to an entrepreneur. You're like, well, that seems like a good thing, but it really is outside of their investment thesis. And so coming into the Biotools Innovator and I saw the investors that were there and I'm like, oh gosh, well, like there's a difference. Like these investors are different. And as an entrepreneur, you're always told There's two ways to fundraise. You can bring a fishing pole to the lake and cast your net, throw your hook in and see what catches. Or you can throw that wetsuit on, grab a spear gun and jump in the water and hunt what you want. And most people do the fishing pole. They throw the net out as wide as they can. They don't want to cut anybody out. And they end up having hundreds of conversations to find the investors that will invest in their company. But I think what's great about biotools is It's all those people in the room already. You don't have to explain to them about the cell and gene therapy market. You don't have to explain to them what an exosome is. They already get it and follow these markets. So from that perspective, it's really invaluable because even if you already have investment, 
you're going to raise more rounds later. And this ecosystem is poised to invest in good companies. I like that. I like that. I think what MedTech Innovator or Bio2 Limiter was basically a bowl of fish where they already threw a bomb. All the irrelevant investors were thrown out. All the relevant ones stayed back so that you're not going to waste time going after the wrong investors. Maybe you can touch upon like, what were your biggest challenges when you came into the program? I know money is a problem for every startup founder. I'm trying to double click on any other ways you were benefiting from the program. Sure. Well, before I do that, I'll tell you another story. So last week, actually, I was having lunch with another entrepreneur and they're in our space and they were sort of talking about how they've raised $10 million and they're looking to raise their Series A. And it took so much work to get that $10 million in. And they were talking about the program and how it could help them. And, you know, I told them part of the program is you actually create a one minute video about your company. Hmm. And in terms of like what I got out of the program, no entrepreneur in early stage company is going to spend any budget or time on a one minute video about us as a marketing tool. But we were forced to do it in the program. And it ended up being one of the most tangibly valuable things we came away with from the program. Because in one minute, it forced us to tell our story in a simple way to a lay audience. It saved so much time and energy in terms of introductions, because we could say, hey, here's a video about us, watch this video. And then if you still want to meet, let me know. But this company was asking me about how can we improve our messaging? How can we better communicate to investors what we do? Because we spend so much time educating them about the cell space and the cell incubation space. And it's a lot of work and it's hard. And I'm like, yeah, you know, it is hard. <laughs> it's hard to get people to invest in things they're not familiar with. And I'm like, the video is for sure valuable. And I'm like, you'd get that. And I was like, but you could really work on improving your messaging to an audience that's still not going to get it. Or you could join the program and just start talking to the right people who already get what you are doing. And his eyes lit up and he's like, wow. He's like, yeah, that sounds a lot better. <laughs> I think it goes back to Paul's point about teaching them about value proposition. It's value proposition, but it's also talking to the right people. So in terms of like what I got out of the program, I told you the video was immensely valuable, you know, as just sort of strategic stuff we got out of it. A lot of times when you meet investors, they'll say, send me your executive summary, send me your deck. And the goal with the first meeting with an investor is to get a meeting. You want to get them on the phone in a conversation and start a dialogue. That's the goal. And so... Oftentimes, I found when I sent that deck or that executive summary, and as Paul said, we're all awful at creating these PowerPoint documents. I'm not bad at it, but still, it's really hard to tell my story without me sitting there telling the story on top of the deck. And so I often found I didn't good responses or they wouldn't follow up when I did that. And so what I started doing was I said, hey, here's this one minute video. Watch this video. If you still want the deck or you want to meet after that, let me know. And it was such a better way to engage in those conversations and allowed me to push back a little bit. But I think it really created more quality conversations because they were able to get in one minute whether they want to meet with me as opposed to spending 15 minutes trying to figure out my deck. I also think like hiring, I think investing is like hiring. And Paul, you can tell me if you've got a different opinion. But I feel like when I'm hiring, I want to hire everybody. I think everybody's great. And so when I look at her as I'm like, yes, I want to figure out how I can use them. And then when we interview, I've already decided I want to hire them, probably. But what I'm looking for are all the reasons not to hire them. I'm looking for disqualifiers. I'm looking for anything to give me a no <laughs> out of this person. And if they get through the interview and there's no no's, I'm like, okay, well, that's a pretty good candidate. I think investors are similar. I think they want to make investments and they're looking for all the reasons to say no. Now, maybe the psychology is a little different, but I think that when you're engaging with these investors... It's really, they're looking at everything and they're looking for reasons not to invest. They're looking for a weak team. They're looking for a poor market. They're looking for a bad product. They're looking for unprofessionalism. They're looking for all these things. And if you give them those, then they'll find a reason not to invest and move on. But if you don't give them any of those, then they get really interested. Yeah, yeah. I agree with all the points you mentioned. I want to go back to something you talked about the PowerPoint decks and the one minute videos. I hate PowerPoints. I know that that is something that investors like to see to make a decision. I'm, I'm more of a investor memo kind of a guy where I can write down stuff. People can read and understand it than trying to interpret what is on a PowerPoint deck, especially if you don't want to put too many words on a slide deck. 
I don't know if you guys have any observations, Paul, Eilert, and Jim, can you move the industry towards that direction? To me, it's very rare. In fact, to me, it's never happened that you have one meeting with an investor and your deck blows them away and they're like, I need to put my money in this immediately. Yeah. It hasn't happened to me and I've not really seen that happen ever. So like I said, these investor conversations, the goal is to get a meeting and the goal of the meeting is to get a second meeting and the goal of the next meeting is to get another meeting. And you're building a dialogue and a relationship. And oftentimes, I think it's best to build that relationship because a lot of them are going to be looking for you and how your milestones are developing over the next six months. You know, this I met this guy six months ago. How's he doing? Did they do what they said they were going to do? Have they made any progress? And if you do that, then you impress them. And then they start feeling confident about you. So for me, it's not really transactional in the way we all think about it. It's really relationship building. It's leveraging those relationships. Thank you. Paul? I think with investors, just like Jim said, there's no scenario in which an investor looks at your deck and goes, all right, I'll write a check. Like that doesn't just happen. Everything's about getting these meetings. Jim's right on. It's about getting a meeting, getting the next meeting and so on. So it's having enough to be exciting enough in your deck that you answer the main questions they're going to have And they're going to say, this is interesting enough for me to take a meeting. Like, that's what you want. You don't want a 30 slide deck or a 50 slide deck or something crazy. You want a teaser deck that has a very clear story with a beginning, middle and end that that answers all the key things. And you'd be surprised how often people send these decks around or submit decks to us as part of their application where they just leave it. They're like, we're a clinical stage company, but they don't tell you anything about the clinical data they have. And you go, well, you got to be able to show me something. Tell me anything about the clinical trial. Tell me whatever it is, like what's the status? How big is it? Whatever you can show us. And they'll say, oh, I didn't want to share that because it's a non-confidential deck. Mainly the results of your clinical work, that's not really that confidential. So at the end of the day, you got to give people enough of a teaser that they want to have a conversation. That's the key. And don't leave out your team. Like Jim said, people are looking for reasons to say no. If they can't assess the team, they're not going to take a meeting. So you got to have a slide about your team. Like, oh, I thought I'd save that for the meeting. Mm -hmm. Well, put it in the deck. We want to know who the team is. What's their, and we don't need all the details. We just want to see what companies have they worked for? What's their experience? So it's just the basics, the development timeline and the milestones. Those are important things that need to be in the decks. So I see this all the time that people make these mistakes where they send three slides or five slides and there's nothing in there, or they do the opposite and they send 30 slides and there's so much that the people just get turned off. So Probably a deck of seven to 10 slides is somewhere in the right range for a teaser deck. And definitely don't write confidential on a deck that's non-confidential because there are a lot of people that won't even look at confidential decks, especially if they're corporate venture. If they're corporate in any way, they will just throw that into the delete box. If it says confidential, they can look at it. And we require that when people apply to MedTech Innovator, they can only turn in non-confidential slides. And if we get a slide deck that says confidential on the bottom of every slide, we write them a message back and say, hi, you submitted a confidential deck. Can you please resubmit one that's non-confidential? And we will not share that with our viewers. So it's just having a clean story and making sure that, as Jim said, you're trying to avoid the reasons to say no, because that's 100% right. Investors are looking to say no. It was the thing I hated the most about my job as investor was saying no, but it's the thing you do the most. And you really are, you're looking for exclusions and you're saying, oh, they're based in the UK and that's too far from us. But if your company that's going, well, but actually we're opening a US office. Well, tell me that in the deck, because you know, I'm going to have that as an objection. I want to make sure you have a US and not just a US office, probably a plan to headquarter in the US or have key team members there. So if that's your plan, don't save that for the later meeting, put that in the deck. So I know that it's your plan. Any objections that you think people are going to have You want to head them off as best you can in the shortest way possible in a deck. So those are some tips. But overall, do not expect, like I've had people walk up to me and say, ah, I had investor meetings, but no one's committed yet. Well, of course they haven't committed yet. I mean, that's the first meeting. You're going to have a meeting and then a meeting and a meeting and another meeting and you're going to have diligence. You're going to have a lot. It's very rare that somebody just jumps in and writes a check unless you're very, very, very advanced. And even then they don't go that fast. They still want to do their own diligence. So let me add how Biotools Innovator and MedTech Innovator can help companies in this position. Because I think one of the exciting things about this program, if you make it in, is we give you mentors. And these mentors come from strategics, they come from investors, and they come from other entrepreneurs. 
And so if you make it in the program and you're trying to fundraise, you're getting ready for your seed round or your series A, you can actually meet with these people in a very friendly, non-confrontational, non-transactional way. And you can have them give you some of this information. Now, you're, you're always going to wonder like, well, what do people expect to see on this slide? Or what are they looking for on this slide? Or can you give me feedback on this slide? So we can actually hook you up with people who will give you really great feedback and tell you they might see a couple hundred decks a year and you can get their feedback to help align and strategize yours. So I think that's one big benefit you can get from our networking people. Add a little tidbit here that I think, you know, it's the iterative nature of that process, right? Of being able to present and present again and present again. And if you keep repeating the same message, don't change and don't adapt, that is where I think a lot of the companies fail. And so one of the things that we do and that I like to see is the difference between the pitch decks that we have in the beginning of the program or during the selection process, what we initially get in the application to the pitch decks that the companies are using when they are presenting as finalists or as showcase companies, that is transformational. What we see is the before and after, if you will, is really transformational. And this is a big part of what we do, supporting that transition, that storytelling, either through the deck or through a video or whatever it is that, or a conversation. And I think one of the things that I like to do, and maybe it's a little secret, during our pitch events, that is part of our selection process before you even make it to the accelerator. Jim mentioned it as his experience and Paul mentioned it it before. What I like to do is looking at companies and sometimes following them through different tables. And it's the companies that adapt through the immediate feedback that they're getting. A deck is a deck, right? You have a deck with you, right? Some of them will even be as creative as changing things on the spot. And some of them will use the same deck without changing it, but really adapt the way they're talking about things. And this is what I like to look at in companies. And some of us, we follow these companies, we look for the ones that really listen and implement that feedback, even in that short time span, and especially from the beginning to the end of the program. This is all great advice. Thank you. I we are reaching the end of the show. I want to make sure if we haven't talked about something that we should know about MedTech Innovator or BioTools Innovator and if there are any plugins for the audience. I could start off with a little bit about the overall application process. So again, as I mentioned before, you got to apply to get in. So that's medtechinnovator.org or biotoolsinnovator.org. You go there and you click on the apply link in the nav bar and That'll get you started. You create an account, you fill out an application. It's going to take a little time to fill in that application. So I would not start it on the deadline day. The deadline's January 31st. Do not start it on the 31st because you may run out of time. We give people the ability to continue to update their applications through the entire application window and even beyond. Because after the application window closes, we're still going through a process to choose the companies that we're going to advance to pitch. And we'll choose about 20% of the companies to actually pitch us in person. And that happens over several months. So you can continue to even update your information after submitting, but you got to get that application in before January 31st ends the end of the day. So I encourage people to start now, start their application after you're listed in this podcast, start your application. You can continue to update it. You can even add another team member and they can co-edit the application with you. You have multiple people working on the application. I encourage you to do that. Go through the whole application, look for everything. So you have an idea of what you have ahead of you at several pages and make sure you just know what you need to fill in. And that way you can kind of get the time and to get a sense of what it is that you have to complete. Got to have an attachment and that should be a presentation, PowerPoint of some kind, because most of our reviewers, the first thing they do is they flip ahead to the deck. And they open up the deck and they skim through it. And then they go back and they read the rest of the details. So definitely have a deck that has, we say you have to upload an attachment and we suggest a deck, but some people just put a summary on and that's not really enough. So I definitely think you should have a deck and it should have the kind of information I was talking about earlier. It should have some details about the whole story really effectively. And they don't have to have the entire, every single detail, but just the highlights have to be in the deck. If you think someone's going to ask for it later and go, what about that? Then put it in. Then the other thing I would say is if you know somebody who has gone through MedTech Innovator, we give a priority to applications that are nominated from someone. 
but people will not nominate someone they don't know. So it doesn't mean like if you go, oh, well, I know you went through MedTech Innovator, can you nominate me? They're not going to nominate you because they know their reputation is on the line. So it's got to be, if you're saying if it's someone you don't really know. But if you do know somebody who's been through MedTech Innovator, in addition to finding out what the program's all about and maybe getting some general tips from them, have them nominate you directly if they will. And not everybody, and we only give people four nominations, so they can't have an unlimited blank checkbook to nominate 100 companies. But if they haven't nominated too many companies yet and they can nominate you, that puts you into our priority queue for reviews, which means you get bumped to the top of the list as we're reviewing applications. And that does make a difference as we're choosing companies to advance to pitch, because as those slots fill up, you lose the opportunity to pitch maybe in a location that's near you. So I do encourage people to apply early. We start looking at companies now. We're already reviewing companies. So the earlier you apply, the better you know, we don't wait till January 31st to start looking at companies. We're already reviewing companies as we speak. So I encourage you to apply early. And the last thing I'll mention is that we have several info sessions that we've done. They're on our YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and search for MedTech Innovator and go to our channel, you will find videos where we talk in depth about the application and the process and the benefits. And it is absolutely worth watching that video. You will get tips on applying and tips on things that we're looking for, similar to things we've been talking about today a little bit, but there's more. So it's worth watching one of those info sessions. It will save you time. Excellent. Thank you. I will have plugins for everything that you mentioned in the show notes for people to access it easily. Eyelid, any closing comments from you or plugins? Yeah, absolutely. One last thing I will say, our team is an email away. Please feel free to reach out to us with any questions. It's a large volume of applications that we're receiving, and people have a lot of questions about the application process, about what program is the right fit for me. We are here to take these questions, to talk to you, support at MedTech Innovator, support at Biotools Innovator. Just reach out to us. And as Paul said, join our info sessions, look at our LinkedIn page. We have LinkedIn Live we streamed live those info sessions so you can follow these or join the next one on January 17th, which you can find on our website. Great. Thank you, Paul, Eilid, and Jim. Thank you for joining the show. I learned a lot. I highly recommend this program because I'm in love with it from whatever I heard so far. But thank you, Jim, for sharing your story. I know you're the associate director of the program now. If I'm not wrong, I'm glad you're coming back and joining and sharing your experiences. We need more of you people. But good luck with everything. And thank you for being on the show. Thanks, Naresh. Thank you for having us, Naresh. That was Thanks, a pleasure. Naresh. Yeah, we All enjoyed right. the conversation. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Lab to Startup podcast. You can find links to the resources and programs mentioned in these episodes, connect with Naresh, or subscribe to this show at labtostartup.com. <laughs>